Welcome to the Time Bubble Podcast, the only podcast where the guests get to travel in time. I'm your host, Jason Ayres, and this week I'm delighted to be joined by another author, and not just another author, another time travel author. So welcome, Keith A. Pearson. It's lovely to be here, Jason. Thank you for uh, inviting me on. Yes, yes, great. Great to have you here. So tell us a little bit about your books. Oh, wow. Um, I (laughs) um, I always struggle with that question because uh, you think as an author, you'd have a fairly stock answer. But um, I I guess they are, you could broadly describe them as low fantasy. So we touched on time travel. So it's an, an every man who happens to find himself in an extraordinary situation being flung back in time or whatever it may be. Yes, and I think we're very similar in that respect because looking at the the time travel genre, there are sort of specific areas uh, which you could you can see. So, for example, uh, um, within the time travel romance category, which is not really us, I'm sure you've seen the what what I call the Highlander romance. Uh, there there are thousands of these Mills and Boone type books, and they all seem to follow the same plot of uh, a woman thrown back to the Scottish <laughs> 19th century. They always have a, a guy with massive rippling muscles on the front <laughs> of But we don't do any of that. Ours yeah. is more about the man in the pub, really, isn't it? And, yeah, <laughs> it's very much the, the, the sort of middle-aged guy who's probably not you know achieved everything or half of what he intended to in, in life so certainly with mo- the, most of the characters i if not all of them are all sort of fairly aver- average is a good way of describing them they are just average blokes who find themselves in extraordinary situations yeah you and me both so i would say to anyone listening that if you do like my books go and check out keith's because chances are you're going to like those as well and uh, ditto. Yeah, good. Well, now that we've done the bit of uh, mutual <laughs> marketing, <laughs> we'd better um, plug on with the podcast, which is great yes. because just like what we write about every day, we are talking about travelling in time. So in a way, you're going to get the opportunity today to be almost like one of the characters in your own novels. That would be interesting, um, depending <laughs> on which character is, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. So what we're going to do, first of all, is give you three different days of your own life that you can revisit. If you could go back and live a day again, which day would it be? So this is one day I get to go back and um, re- experience that day. Yes, you can experience that day. Um, people interpret this in different ways. Some just like yeah. to go back and live a day over again. Others sometimes think, well, is that a day where I could do something differently or change something? Um, that it, it Basically, interpret it as you will. As I wish. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I've got my own time machine and I can set the rules. Yeah. Um, so it probably won't surprise anyone to, to, uh, to hear that I'm – one of my first days, one of the one of my earliest memories um, of a significant day in my life was in the eighties, um, and it was the Christmas of my thirteenth birthday. And on that particular day, I opened up um, a box which was wrapped, uh, obviously, uh, in Christmas paper, and I unveiled an Auric Atmos home computer. Um, wow. Yes, and I guess most people will, will think, you yeah, know, what is <laughs> – everyone thinks about Commodore 64s and ZX Spectrums and, and, and the like, but they were very expensive. And my parents weren't particularly well off. So I think they bagged a bargain somehow on this Auric Atmos, which was, uh, you know, a little-known uh, personal computer. But I could not have cared less. I mean, it was – the, the, up until that point, my only experience of computers had been at school where we had a couple of uh, BBC micros, as I think every school did. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, it was always normally sort of two or three machines to a class of 30. So at best, you'd be peering over someone's shoulder, um, just sort of staring at that screen, wishing you could get a go. Um all the arcades, you know, video games in arcades, you know, and back then we're talking, you know, Space Invaders, Galaxians, that that sort of, you know, very primitive type of stuff. So to have this this device, which 
allowed me to, to play video games and all sorts of other, do all sorts of other things um, was just the most incredible. And I can remember the feeling, the excitement. Um, I wanted a computer and I never thought I would get one. Um, and I think this was about the time that, do you remember the movie War Games? Yes. Um, about a sort of computer. And that, I think I watched that, when did that come out? I was, it must've been about 11 or so. And it just, it, that I think sparked my initial interest. And, it was such a generational thing, and I don't think we've experienced anything like that. The dawn of the personal computer. This is really the. This was the genesis of everything that we we you know we're talking now on Zoom. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, you can take literally take everything back to that particular period in the eighties, the the uh, explosion of personal computers. So to be part of that was was huge, and the I. I to this time, I'm sure my wife won't want to hear this, but I don't think I've ever been quite so excited. Um, it was just, it was a real thrilling moment, and I don't think I left my bedroom. I'm a teenager, so um, I don't think I left my bedroom for for uh, probably about six weeks after that. Yeah, no, it was an amazing time, and it all happened so quickly because yeah. uh, I'm about the same age as you, and. Uh, 1984 uh, I got a ZX Spectrum so uh, that, was, that was one of the most well known uh, I mean I don't remember the Auric Atmos to be honest but there were a lot of other computers around there was something called a VIC-20 I can't remember exactly what that, that was, was the uh, Commodore 64's little brother I think yeah. with a very memory uh, but technology developed so quickly because I, I can remember the first time I saw a digital watch was something yeah. like about 1976 and a pocket yeah. calculator. In fact, it was the, the guy, um, Clive Sinclair, who, who, who made the Spectre, I believe he did invent the first pocket calculator or the yes. first mass market one. But that that time back in, like you say, 1984, and the, the games market was just beginning. Yeah. Um, because it was all new, it was innovative. And uh, unlike now, where the games industry is just this massive, bloated giant, yeah. which churn, rather like Hollywood, that just keeps but churning out superhero movies. It's just ch churning out more versions of Call of Duty and driving games and, you know, the big sellers. and Franchises. Uh, yeah. Big on the, uh, those early games, people that they, people were just literally inventing the different yeah. types of games. Uh, well, the genre didn't exist, yeah. didn't they? You were no. literally creating genres. Yeah. So it, it was so, so exciting. And it, it really did feel like we were, you know, the beginning of something in, incredible. Yeah. Uh, it was an amazing time. It was. I mean, I could. I had friends and we used to go round to each other's houses and we'd have the tapes and we'd be loading yeah. them up and <laughs> copying the tapes and all the rest of the stuff that used to go. Yeah. But I remember, I mean, do you remember WH Smith used to have a big computer section and they had all the computers set up down there? They were where we bought most of our games from. And um, I, I don't know if you did this prank as a, a schoolboy where you'd go into Smith's and you'd, because uh, you could program these machines. So you'd go up yeah. to the machine and you'd put <laughs> 10, 10 prints. <laughs> yeah, some obscenity, and then yeah. tw 20 go to 10. So it would yeah. just keep scrolling up and up on the screen. And um, I, if, you, if you were clever enough, you could actually program it so that the shop assistant wouldn't be able to break in and stop yeah. it. Uh, all very childish, but but a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wonderful times. So, okay, that's great. Let's move on then, and um, you can tell us about your second day. Okay, so I need to reference my uh, list here. So this will be going forward. This is going forward a few. All of my um, my days are actually in my sort of teenage years. Um, I think since, since the advent of sort of digital photography and smartphones and everything else, we seem to sort of capture every moment of our lives. But people of our generation, the whole swathes of primarily our youth that just remain undocumented. You know, there's yeah. very little photographic evidence nothing really so that from that period um yeah you know, I, I think the memories are because they're only in my head they seem to be slightly i've got, I've got nothing else to reference them so they tend to be more poignant i think but the second one would be yeah go on sorry i was going to say in some ways that's a good thing um there's too much you know everything is filmed now everything is recorded um the, the 80s was probably the last decade where we sort of had that freedom. And, you know, in some ways, I don't think I would want 
everything that I did in the 1980s being on camera or, you know, because uh, we did embarrassing things as teenagers, but thankfully there's no record of them. So we got away no, with it. There is that. There is that. <laughs> my second, uh, talk over embarrassing, yeah. so my second one would be, uh, this would be January 1987. Um, now, I am unfortunately a fan of one of the most unfashionable and I, I'm afraid to say unsuccessful football teams of all time. So Aldershot were formed in, I think, 1926, and they went bust in 1991 and then reformed in 1992. So we've got almost 100 years of history in which we've never really achieved very much, um, never really troubled much higher than the sort of seconds to bottom and bottom runs of the football ladder. Um, obviously, we've gone bust, never been to Wembley. So as uh, unsexy a football team you couldn't wish to follow. Um, but oh, this particular season, we were drawn against Oxford United. And at the time, they were um, in the equivalent of the Premier League. And we were a lowly team at the bottom of the, of the you know, football ladder. So it was a real sort of David and Goliath um and uh it was i remember they what happened is that they tripled the prices because there was a limit on the attendance so a really poor crowd absolutely freezing cold january day <clears throat> but you know uh, against the odds we, we won that game three nil and my unfashionable little team that I, by that point i'd supported for sort of three or four years uh, was suddenly in the national media, you know, it was on, we were on TV, the highlight. I mean, it was incredible for somebody who, you know, just been watching this team battle out nil-nil draws against the likes of Halifax and York and, you know, other um, sort of bottom feeders. To, to have this experience, this exposure, was just, just incredible. So, it, you know, it's it remains one of my highlights as a, as a football fan. And indeed, you know, as a... Uh, as a young man as well. It really, really stuck with me. Yeah. Well, remarkably, um, that match to most people has probably long since faded into obscurity. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I just happened to be, having been born and bred in Oxford, an Oxford United supporter. I've so I... <laughs> uh, maybe I'm the first Oxford fan you've ever met. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I do do remember that day well. Now I wasn't at the match because it was an away match. So um, at the time, everyone in Oxford was really into the football, and I did have a season ticket, and uh, we used to go every week. And just to talk a little bit about Oxford, for the majority of their history, they have been similarly unsuccessful <laughs> <laughs> so they came up from the non-leagues in the 60s and they they sort of just were in the sort of third division for years and years and years and then uh they had this remarkable run of success and i'll come on to why in a moment because there's a story about that um in 1983 and 84 they won consecutive third and second division titles and suddenly they were in what is the equivalent of the premier league which was remarkable. And along the way, they had these amazing cup runs where they were knocking out Manchester United and, and people like that as well. So uh, we had this amazing run. The first year that we were in the top division, we won the League Cup, which I went to Wembley to see. And we similarly were seen as underdogs that day. Uh, but we went and won 3-0 against QPR, who were sort of higher than us in the league at that time. Um, so it was an amazing time. They lasted three years. And then um, the money ran out and they went downhill. Now, I don't know if you know where Oxford's money came from, but it was from a certain Mr. Robert Maxwell. I do remember certain, uh, uh, reading something about the um, the Thames Valley Royals. Yes. I think he was talking about Reading and Oxford uh, amalgamating them. I, I seem to remember stories of that, and I certainly remember Maxwell's name popping up. Yes. Well, the the, the amalgamation of Reading and Oxford was not popular amongst both sets of fans, <laughs> as you can imagine. And I remember to this day, um, I don't know if it's still there, but there was some graffiti uh, in a builder's yard in Oxford, um, which was there. It was was there for donkey's years, and somebody had scrawled painted on the wall. Maxwell can stick his Thames Valley Royals up his arse. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, unfortunately, when um, 
Maxwell took his dive over the side of the boat. Um, not only did he take the Daily Mirror pension fund with him, but all of Oxford's money went as well. So they, 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 they went plummeting down and um, ended up falling out of the Football League into the non-leagues. By I the do <laughs> so, yeah, we, we did. We have our paths have crossed subsequently, uh, but I think you you you're back back where you yeah back where, where where you more or less. Now. More or less exactly where they were when I first found out they existed yeah. about 48 years ago. So it's all been pretty pointless, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but at least you had your highs. We we, we yeah. never had any highs. Um, it has literally been uh, 100 years of... of, of yeah. Um, the only time we actually had any success is when we went bust and had to start at the very bottom of the football pyramid yeah. and then clamber back up. And, of course, we still had a decent... Uh, hardcore support so we would you know go to grounds that had a typical attendance of a hundred and you know a thousand order shop fans would descend yeah. and that was you know those were good times we were a big fish in a small pond but yeah. very quickly and then we actually got back into the football league which was remarkable um, but no, nobody had any plan what to do when we got there it was like yeah. well we're, we're here now uh now what and of course a couple of years later the wheels fell off Back into long league we fell. So, but you know, at, at least you've had your day in uh, day at Wembley. Got some rub shoulders with the footballing yeah. elite. Um, we're still playing the likes of um, I'm trying to think of some of the names now: Chorley and um, Ilkston and, uh, and and the yeah. like. So, <laughs> but you did. Not good times. You had that moment in the sun that day against Oxford, and I I re- yes. I remember the day well because I say I wasn't there, so. Um, when that result came in, I was watching final score on grandstand, and I, it would have been probably Des Lynam in those days. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I could believe it when we sort of saw saw the result. It was like, oh, you know, and it was that was quite a big thing because what a lot of people probably don't remember was that the cup was a much bigger deal in those days. You didn't have top flight side sides putting out weakened squads no, just to play, play. so it was a you know it was a genuine victory we weren't playing our b team so um fair play i, I guess I you just I remember wasn't it john aldridge's last game before he went off for a big money move to liverpool he went to liverpool and yeah. um we had i can't remember if we had dean saunders then or if he came later but we had a lot of we had um quite a few internationals in our squad yeah uh, there was billy hamilton who played for northern ireland and Various other things. It was uh, yeah, I, games, I, I, the I can, deep grass of uh, old football nostalgia now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can remember every name of every player in that team in the nineteen eighties, and I'd, I'd I'd struggle to name any of the current team because I just I'm just not as interested in football as as I once was. It's uh, no, I, no, I'm with you there. I think it, the trouble is now it's so much more. You know, it's, it's so money led, and it's. Yeah, you know, the players there that you know that they're not there for their anything else than the, the money. There you are know, these sort of times where somebody would grow up, play for their hometown club for their whole career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. those days are, are, are pretty much gone, I think. Um, which is you know understandable. This the career is short. You've got to make as much money as you can. So it's a, it's a very different sport these days. I think it, you can say that about a lot of sports, can't you? I mean, yeah. you, you take it's all very manicured. You look at things like Formula One, you never get, or snooker, you're never going to get another James Hunt or Alex Higgins yeah. or any of those types of personalities, are you? So yeah. m- more's the pity. It's probably why we write, why we write so many books about the 1980s because they were so great. And that's not just old blokes. Life was better. <laughs> I know that any young people, oh, it's just two old blokes talking about the good old <laughs> days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, good. All right. Well, let's um, move on then, and you can tell us about your third day. Okay, so this would be a day in June 1989. So my best mate Dave and I um, decided in our wisdom that we were going to be famous DJs. And we were both working in retail at the time and we packed up, we quit our jobs and obviously pre-internet days here. And via, I think it was Dalton's Weekly or something, we found an advert for cheap flights to Malaga. And with no plan, we got on a plane and uh, the first time either of us had got on a plane and we got a flight to Malaga. And we found ourselves in the delightful resort of Torremolinos, (laughs) um, which is... 
I, I, I don't know how to describe it. Um, it was just a, 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 a shithole, I think is probably the best way. <laughs> um, but, you know, after uh, a couple of weeks, you know, uh, I managed to get a job as, as a DJ in this awful dive nightclub. Dave was doing what they call propping, which was dragging poor tourists into clubs. And for, um, you know, a, a, I think it was probably about six weeks, we were having just the most amazing time. Two 18-year-old guys, um, you know, footloose, fancy free. And the particular day in mind, um, I just finished working. I think I finished at 4 a.m. And there were a lot of Brits our age out there at the time working. And we sort of got to know one another. And we would all congregate on the beach after we finished work, which is about 4, 4.30 wow. in the morning. And we'd have beers and um, yeah, and we'd just watch the, 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 the sun come up, basically. Um, and I remember one particular day we were doing this and, and just that feeling of just being completely and utterly carefree. Um, and I think to, to this day, I don't think I've ever been completely and utterly carefree. Um, I think you want, you know, certainly once you, you have kids, you pick up a mortgage, you have a career, you know, you're always carrying some modicum of, of uh, worry with you. Um, but then the, it, it was such an incredible experience just watching, you know, watching the sun come up, knowing that, you know, nothing to do for the day but sleep and mess around with mates and get drunk and then you know, you would carry on doing that i mean it didn't the whole thing did not end well um if you can uh, remember perry kevin and perry go large I actually well, watched it last week funnily enough because we, we were we were away on holiday and uh, we were looking for something to watch on amazon prime and uh, i thought my teenage son might enjoy it which he did it's a brilliant uh, film yeah it has actually aged pretty well, I think. Yeah, because it's 20 years or more. Yeah. Um, and it was a bit like that, but with also, if you've seen the Inbetweeners movie, it was a bit yeah. of that as well, too. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's the first time we'd, we'd even been on a plane, let alone been away from home and, and all this sort of stuff. So it was, it was a proper adventure. And, you know, for, for all the time we were there, we had the most amazing time, did all the things that, you know, your typical 18-year-old lads would do. It was just unbridled and wild and incredible um and then it all came to a, a grinding halt and we had to we had to come home um but yeah that, that as i said that particular day i would give anything to have that feeling again where you just don't you, you can't see it there and there's nothing on your horizon um not a single cloud and as i say i think it's you know it's just adulthood isn't it you you're going to pick up that stuff but I, I would I would dearly love to go back to that particular day and experience that feeling of just not having anything to worry about. Yeah, I mean, one of my probably greatest regrets, well, I suppose it's not a regret really, but um, of having experienced similar is not appreciating it as much at the yes. time. Because you, you just don't know, do you? You don't realize you see the parents with responsibility but when you're sort of 17 18 19 there's this disconnect you don't think you're ever going to be that uh there's just <laughs> yeah probably, youth is wasted on the young youth is well on the young yeah i mean I, I think my equivalent experience would have been in the summer of 1987 when i took quite a leap into the unknown and i went on one of those uh pgl holidays do you remember those oh, yeah. yeah so i went to the south of france and it was one of these things where it was quite a brave thing to do because i didn't go with anyone that i knew uh so my dad took me down to waterloo I effectively got on a, a coach with about 40 or 50 other 16 to 18 year olds and uh we, we went down to france and i you know we, we we all bonded and made friends on the coach and then we spent a week's sort of windsurfing on the uh, on the med and then we spent a week canoeing down the ardèche gorge and every night was sort of a party and girls and boys getting together we were just at that sort of coming of age <laughs> thing and i i mean I never saw any of the people that I met on that holiday again or even really stayed in touch with them because this is another thing that we didn't have social media. Yeah. Now you'd be adding them on Facebook and you'd yeah. still be texting. So it, it was like a, a two-week microcosm with a group of people, uh, just a snapshot, uh, and that was it. But I remember on that holiday there were there was no worries about school 
or jobs or work. It was it, just pure enjoyment. And you try to recapture it, don't you? Because, that I mean, that was probably the last time I was completely free. Uh, we talk about Kevin and Perry go large. I did do the whole Ibiza thing in the mid, <laughs> in, in the mid to late 90s. I went on what would be probably frowned upon by some people, the equivalent of a Club 1830 holiday. <laughs> and I was getting to the upper part of that age range by then. It was about two years before the film came out. And it was every bit similar to to what the, the, the film portrayed. And now you see, I had a career and a job and a house then, but so it was only a holiday, but it, it, it was possible, you know, to sort of pretend That's all itself. of that had gone yeah. away. Yeah. And I, you know, uh, and I, I would say that particular holiday was the last time I really had that sense of complete freedom. And then proper adulthood kicked in. But I ne- I managed to mess around until I was sort of in my early 30s. So I, I did quite well. But I'm anyone very... listening to this who's thinking, anyone younger than us is thinking, my God, is this my future? Yeah. What I would say, actually, is things of, of, I think between the ages of sort of 25 and 45, you've got a lot, a lot going. Most of us have got a lot going on. Yeah. But I found this, I turned 50 last year. It's my birth, my 51st birthday next week. And I have found over the last four or five years that actually things have eased back a bit. So I'm starting not to, again, it may be an age thing. Well, I, I'm starting not to really care about the stuff that bothered me, um, that has bothered me. I, I didn't really, I'm not that fussed too much about neg- having, you know, I, I try and keep a lot of negativity out of my life. I don't watch the news. I think you get to the point where you think, you know what, right, I, I can protect myself from a lot of this worry and stress and, and grief and and that's yeah one reason why I do the job I do is because I can you know hide myself away and uh, talk to my imaginary friends all day and and that's that, that's kind of cool I don't have to put up with you know the yeah. kind of people yeah. that cause me stress throughout yeah. most of my career. No I mean writing these books for a living is is a, is a wonderful job to do um yeah. the only thing I really miss about the office days is the sort of the social side of it but I even agree. that may, may wasn't as yeah. good. Uh, it, but it working at home, it, it can be quite isolating. So you do need to find other ways to to interact with people. I think December is a tricky month. Uh, you you tend to see a lot of people on on social media, you know, talk about work parties and office parties. And yeah, yeah I do get a pang of envy there because yeah. I do remember working in office. December was always a good month because it was, it was really really quiet. Um, but you know, there was always you know parties or drinks or whatever it may be, and I I, I kind of missed that element of it. But yeah. the rest of it, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, there's no way. I mean, my biggest fear in life now is that one day my books are going to stop selling and I'm going to have to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, that is a recurring nightmare. I've got to be honest. <laughs> Horrifying thought. Yeah, it, it literally is. Um, <laughs> But it's also a very, very strong motivator to sit down every day yeah. and carry on writing. People say, how do you do it? You think, well, um, you'd have known the job I had before you <laughs> realise I don't want to be going back to that. So, exactly. that, yeah, that for me is is definitely a motivator. Definitely. OK, well, those were three great days and we had a lot in common to talk about there. So that was good. So yes. we'll move on to the second part now. And the next question is, if you could be someone else for a day past present or even future who would you choose to be well notwithstanding the fact that i'm not a deeply religious man i would love to be god for the day now okay. whether you believe in god or not <laughs> i think what we all i think what's what humanity needs is someone just to appear and say sort yourselves out um i don't know what it is it's i think maybe over the last I don't know, five, six, seven years, we've just become so entrenched with, with, with our views. Everyone just is so angry and bitter. And I think what the pandemic has taught us, in fact, if you look at the pandemic as a whole, it, it literally showed how amazing humans can be when we all work together for, for, the, for the common good, but equally how tribalistic and selfish and self-centered we can all be as well. I mean, it literally was both ends of the spectrum. And I just wish that uh, 
we, we would all learn to be a bit more cooperative and more the amount of, of money and resources and effort that should be put into things that really matter and not into things that actually don't don't really matter this is me standing on my soapbox now this is probably as as political as i'll ever be but yeah. um i you know it's it, it is frustrating and the older you get you start to realize again that yeah a lot of the stuff that people argue about really doesn't matter no. um uh it, it's it's much nicer just to, to wake up in the morning have a smile on your face and you know, just just live your live your life without all the constant bickering and and tribal adversary and uh, and everything else that seems to go on. Maybe I think social media's got a lot to blame for yeah. all of this. Yeah. But and so if I was God, I'd definitely I, I'd definitely do something about Twitter and uh, Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> I I think that the problem started with Brexit, and we've had several things since then, such as um, COVID. Uh, yeah. cul- culture wars, as as you call them, which yes. can cover all sorts of things, and and then there's been all things, you know, there's been the BLM stuff, and there's been the Ukraine stuff, and I think what what's happened is debate is no longer allowed. It's like that it, it, you have to take a point of view. So you're either totally for something yeah. or totally against. The the no. idea of how two blokes being able to have, have a pub and one of them can be supportive of thing and the other car and you can have a chat and you can have a discussion and then agree to disagree and have a pint yeah. that we've lost that now and it's like there's uh, this is where the whole council cultures come from and it's like so you've got one big you know so it's let, let's poke fun at people that support brexit and call them gammons or let's poke fun at uh, 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 young people and call them snowflakes and it, yeah. it, it's like I'm on this side of the argument. Therefore, these people are my enemy. And that has, has, has really got bad. And I don't think it used to be like that. Like I say, I think Brexit was the first time I noticed it. But then we've just had one thing after another, haven't we? Uh, it it seems then. to me that the factions of society are, are growing and people are becoming more entrenched in those factions. And, yeah. and well, many, many years ago, when I, when I first started my job in sales, my boss at the time told me, gave me a bit of advice. He said, you've got um, two ears and one mouth, and you should remember that and yeah. use them in that order. In other words, listen to what people are saying, talk less. And that has always stuck by me. And I thought, you know, that, that advice is probably as as, uh, as profound today as it was then, because yeah. people aren't willing to listen. You know, no. they want us out their opinions, whatever they may be. Um but nobody really wants to listen. And this is, I think, the, the the problem. And social media has just amplified it. So you can go on to sort of, if it wasn't for the fact that a lot of my readers hang out on social media, I'd probably not not bother with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a lot of very angry, shouty people who have no interest in hearing opinions. They're, they sort of, they just, just want to shout about what they yeah. want to shout yeah. about. And I think they think that the person that shouts the loudest will have the most impact. Yeah. So you can get a relatively minority or uh, group of people that can shout so loudly about something because they want to make everybody think that that's how everybody else thinks. And it just, it, like you like yourself, I don't watch the news um, for that reason. And I try and avoid as much as this stuff as I can because life is too short. It, it is. And... <clears throat> When you actually look at what the the big picture in life, and God, there's just so much more to be. I, people are just so angry and unhappy. I think, and that that annoys me. You think, God, you know, just take a chill pill, and and, yeah. you know, and these things are important. And I'm not trying to den- uh, denigrate the you know, people's feelings about certain s- subjects, but yeah, you, you're not going to achieve anything. Do something about it if you really want to do something about it. Don't just scream on t- on social media. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or you know, call people names or whatever it may be. If you want to do something about something, do something about it. Actually, get out of your chair, put your phone yeah. down, and be proactive about it. Um, and you'll feel better about yourself, and you'll actually be making you know you'll be doing some good in the world. Quite right. Okay. You know, I, I <laughs> <in> my sermon. <laughs> no, very good. Okay, we've got about five minutes left. So one last question: If you could go anywhere in time, where would you go? Right, okay, this would be um, May 1939 and uh, to a small town in Hampshire called Fleet. And the reason I would go there is because that's where my grandmother lived at the time. And she had a a relationship with a Canadian airman. And then nine months later, my dad was born. 
Now, whoever that Canadian airman was, his name never reached my dad's birth certificate. And my nan sort of married later on in life. Um, and we all had my nan's um, maiden name, Pearson. She was she married on uh, to, to somebody else down the line. But um, I think, again, this is something that comes with age. I lost all my grandparents by the time I was 16. So there was always that sort of disconnect, which didn't bother me so much. You know, you don't think about it when you're that young. But as I got older, it's sort of, you know, I, I, I have that sort of barrier now, that void, actually, rather than a barrier between me and my, you know, my previous generations. And a few years ago, I, I started doing a family tree on Ancestry.com. And um, <laughs> on my mother's side, I realized it literally generation after generation of farm laborers <laughs> back for, 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 for years and years and years. So it was particularly uninteresting. On my, my paternal grandmother's side, um, she held, uh, my great grandfather held from Scotland. And there was, again, fairly uninteresting, but they all lived in and around, I think it was in Venice. But the, the mystery remained this Canadian airman um, whose name is a mystery. My nan took his took it to the grave. Um, we'll, we'll never know who he is. Um, and there's a whole part of me that wants to know. Um, you know, I, I have particular traits. You know, where, how did this this ability to write books? I mean, nobody in my family, my even my extended family, has ever written anything. So it must have come from somewhere, you know, physical traits, all these sorts of things. I look around at my cousins and think, well, you know, really that much alike. And so there's this big gap and I, I, there's no hope of ever filling it. So if I could go back in time um, to one particular period for, you know, uh, the temptation would be go back to the 80s and re relive my uh, my days on that beach in Tromolinos. But I think absolutely, I would love to go to 1939. Yeah, no, that's a, a, a great idea. Uh, playing detective in time, yes. which is which is a theme I've thought about putting into a book at some point, but I haven't got around to it. But I think uh, there is a guy. I always I forget. I uh, can't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, but he writes genealogy uh, mysteries, yeah. um, and he's really into all this 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 kind of stuff. I'm, um, I'll pop you his name over so you can add it to the to the podcast notes. But Nathan something rather. But he, he's really into that type of stuff, and uh, he's on is uh, a couple of his are on my to be read pile. My to be read pile, which is now up out to hit three digits, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's really good. Now, uh, before we go, where can people find your books? Okay, so um, if you want to find out about my books and me, probably the best place to go is uh, Amazon. You can go to Amazon, of course. Uh, it's my website, which is keithapearson.com um, or co-uk, if that's your preference. Um, or you can just go to Amazon. I'm also on Twitter and Facebook. Um, if you have anything to discuss as far as politics or religion or anything like that's concerned, <laughs> please don't come and find me. Uh, if you want to talk about biscuits and time travel and that nostalgia and general nonsense, then please do come and find me. That sounds great. Well, I'll put all of that in the show notes. Cool. And um, hopefully you'll you'll get a few uh, book sales. Uh, I like to think this podcast uh, reaches people and uh, we we have an impact, but who knows. At the very least, it's always nice to have a chat with uh, a fellow miserable middle-aged um, <laughs> author. We, we don't get out much, do we, as a rule? So, uh, yeah. No, but we find plenty to write about. So uh, exactly. we lived in good times. So Indeed. Right. Indeed. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for coming along uh, today. My pleasure. A great chat. And um, uh, thanks very much. And I'm sure I'll speak to you again soon. Sure you will. Cheers, Jason. Thanks. Bye. Bye.